It is my great pleasure to welcome you here. It's so nice to have people um, here, but also like to welcome those people who are joining us virtually. Um, so it's it's nice to have have here. We have Trinity Oaks is joining us virtually, and I know we have some folks from the History Club and also from the Genealogical Society come and see. So thanks very much. A bit of housekeeping. Um, so those of you who are at home, um, if you will hover over the picture of the OutCam program, you'll see three little dots in the right-hand corner. If you'll click on pin it, that will make that picture large and you'll be able to see the slides and the speakers much better than if you leave them smaller. Um, so that will be helpful. Also, for those folks that are here, if you do have questions, please wait to be called on. Because we're doing this at Zoom and, um, and virtually, we want everybody to be able to hear what is being said and asked and that sort of thing. And so we want to try and keep the ambient noise in this room down so everybody can hear. Um, and without further ado, our guest speakers tonight are Christine and Dennis McClure, husband and wife. Um, their, their journey with these books came along um, because Christine found some letters from her father, who was the second lieutenant, um, Turner Timberlake was his name, he was the second lieutenant, and he um, was with the 93rd Engineers. He was a white officer with a black unit that was building the Alaskan-Canadian um, Highway. So we're happy to have them, and thank you for being here. Thank you. This gentleman right here is Robert Rucker, and Robert Rucker spent most of his adult life living with his wife and five children in this county. But in World War II, he was a black soldier in the segregated 97th Engineer Regiment. He defended America by enduring vicious cold, muskeg, permafrost, dangerous mountains, and voracious mosquitoes to help build the northernmost section of the Alaska Highway. The Army rewarded him by convicting him along with nine black squad mates on a trumped up charge of mutiny. Most Americans, if they know anything about the Alaska Highway, think of it as a tourist destination, and God knows it offers a stunning experience. But too few people know of its origins or of the black soldiers who endured and suffered to build it. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, American leaders looked north in a panic to the territory of Alaska and its Aleutian Island chain, 15,000 miles of undefended coastline, and no transportation route to it other than the sea existed. In 1940, Brigadier General Simon Buckner commanded the Alaska Defense Command and he warned Washington, D.C. repeatedly that to, to defend Alaska, he needed more supplies, airplanes, ordnance, and soldiers. Getting and maintaining supplies required a land route through the vast subarctic wilderness of northern Canada and Alaska. In 1941, Canada, already at war and more sensitive to the threat, began building a string of airfields north it was called the Northwest Staging Route. President Franklin Roosevelt ordered the Corps of Engineers to build the Alaska Highway. Following that Northwest Staging Route, 1,600 miles of road through the most difficult country in the world, from the railhead of Dawson Creek, British Columbia, to Delta, Alaska. The road had to be finished by winter, eight months. General Sturdivant of the Corps of Engineers assigned four regiments of white soldiers to the project and appointed General William Hogue to command them. A regiment is 1,200 men. Hogue arrived at Dawson Creek in February 1942. Flying over the terrain and consulting local experts, Hogue realized that four regiments would not be enough. General Sturdivant in Washington, D.C. had no more white engineer regiments and with apologies to Hogue, he gave him three engineer regiments of black soldiers. Knowing how General Buckner felt about black soldiers, Sturdivant wrote him an apologetic letter, 
explaining the problem. Bruckner's breathtaking racist reply, quote, the natural result would be that they would interbreed with the Indians and the Eskimos and produce an astonishingly objectionable race of mongrels, end quote. Buckner ordered Sturdivant to keep the black soldiers in the woods and away from villages and towns. This reflected the racism that prevailed in the United States Army in the 1940s. In the beginning, the Army expected little of their black soldiers, but in the end, they got a lot. The black soldiers did not receive any credit for their contribution on the highway. Polk divided the 1,600 miles into sectors, north and south, and he divided the sectors into sections, roughly 300 miles in length. Soldiers would build the highway simultaneously, working toward each other. His headquarters would be north and white horse, Yukon Territory. Sturgeon assigned Colonel, soon to be General James A. O'Connor, to take over the southern sector, Fort St. John, British Columbia. Colonel Engel's white 35th Combat Engineer Regiment boarded trains and rushed north. The first troops arrived on March 9, 1942, at Dawson Creek, and immediately headed north to Fort Nelson, 340 miles. Working 24-7, they hurriedly moved men and their full complement of construction equipment over the frozen Peace River and the frozen ground arriving at Fort Nelson on April 5th. They had all but destroyed their equipment and their exhausted soldiers and only had one month of food. General O'Connor arrived at Dawson Creek to take command of the Southern Sector on the 1st of May. And on that same day, Colonel Lane's newly formed inexperienced white 341st engineers arrived at Dawson Creek with little heavy construction equipment. They encamped at Charlie Lake and tried multiple times to get a rough road start through the mud and muskeg to carry food and supplies to Port Nelson, but failed. Lane decided to bypass the mud and muskeg, and on May 14, a pontoon raft propelled by outboard motors loaded with men and the command car and a D-7 dozer headed up Charlie Lake. A sudden storm with heavy winds and large waves capsized that raft. Twelve soldiers drowned and five were rescued. A month later, Colonel Newman's black soldiers of the 95th Engineer Regiment experienced and fully equipped arrived at Dawson Creek. General O'Connor was more concerned about their race than their experience. He took most of the heavy equipment and gave it to the white 341st, leaving two bulldozers, one dozer, a carry-all, and less than 20 small dump trucks and hand tools for the black soldiers. Colonel Newman, having injured his leg, secluded himself in a tent with a bottle. Morale plummeted. Censors noticed a change in letters written home. However, did not pay attention to the complaints by the black soldiers. But when a white officer, Lieutenant Joseph Jason Cabbage, wrote to his wife, and the officers were, quote, dastardly punks, and it was disgraceful. The Army works for the officer, but the colored man is his slave. This got Sturdivant's attention. Colonel Newman was removed from command and sent home for his help. That same day, July 19th, Colonel Twitchell took command. Now, Twitchell struggled to improve morale. And the regiment then approached the Sikkiti Chief River, and Twitchell saw an opportunity. The glacial waters of this 300-foot-wide river pour through a canyon between two mountains with grades to and from the river greater than 10%. Twitchell convinced General O'Connor to let the 95th build the bridge. The pencil-pushing engineers at headquarters estimated it would take two weeks. Twitchell ordered the engineers to build it in five days. 166 men of Company A raised the ante. They bet a month's pay they could build it in four days. And they did it in three and a half. Then they returned to the unglamorous work of digging ditches and building culverts. Colonel Pauley's white 18th Engineer Regiment arrived at Skagway on April 2nd. The white path in Yukon Railroad carried the soldiers without heavy road equipment 
3,000 feet up over White Pass, through the village of Carcross, and on to Whitehorse. They encamped at a plateau near the airfield. When their equipment arrived, their job was to build a road north toward the Alaska-Canada border. The black soldiers of Colonel Johnson's 93rd engineers traveled by train from Louisiana to Camp Murray, Washington, where they boarded luxury liners that had been changed to troop ships. The ships sailed up the western coast through the Ling Canal and docked at Skagway on April 14. Skagway was, Skagway was a small, old, gold rush city of 450 souls, and it was surrounded by steep, craggy mountains covered in snow. The black soldiers encamped on a grassy airstrip adjacent but not close to Colonel Lyons, 340th White Regiment, that had arrived on the 22nd. Over 2,000 soldiers crowded old buildings, cafes, theaters, wooden planks, sidewalks, and muddy streets. But a six-year-old, Carl Mulvihill, didn't mind the crowd. He rode to school in the big army trucks. They had heaters. He waved and smiled at the black soldiers, but they ignored him. They were told not to talk or visit with the locals. Sergeant Albert France of Company A reported, quote, one thing I do remember quite well was that segregation existed even though we were a part of the U.S. Army. And Private Joseph Prejean, a cook for the 93rd, wrote in a letter, I prefer to file my memory of the Alcan on top of the trash can of history. And finally, Sergeant John Bowman, the regimental photographer, summed it up, quote, we didn't exist before the war, and we don't exist now in a war. The Army rules were Jim Crow rules. They were the same in Skagway as they were in Louisiana. The white 340th moved inland to the village of Tesla, crossed the Sutton Bay to a base camp at Morley Bay. But for them to do that, a 70-mile access road had to be built by the 93rd for the 340th. Many of Hogue's troops would remain in Skagway for many weeks, and Hogue needed those troops to be white. Half of the 340th languished in Skagway for six weeks, and the other half in Whitehorse, organizing shipment of their heavy equipment to Morley Bay. Hogue ordered the black soldiers of the 93rd out of Skagway immediately. With the loan of two bulldozers from the 18th Regiment and limited operational supplies, 93rd Regiment boarded the White Pass and Yukon Railroad on the 1st of May and unloaded at Carcross, Yukon. Carcross, as described by Lieutenant Mortimer Squires, as, quote, just a spot on the road. Black soldiers stood at the train depot, and 10 year old Millie Jones and her schoolmates ran to the depot to see the black, white, men. Millie's mother cooked for Carcross Hotel, and the Army would not allow the black soldiers inside. But when they came to the back door for a drink of water, Mom also gave them baked treats. The soldier noticed the piano inside the hotel. He couldn't go in, so they dragged that piano outside on the plank sidewalk, and he played. Other soldiers with guitars and harmonicas joined him. So 70 years later, my husband and I are sitting in Millie Jones' living room, and Dennis asked her, do you remember what he played? And my, Millie smiled and answered, pistol pack him up. <laughs> Five days later, three companies moved out of car cross. The cat skinner lowered his dozer blade, knocked down trees, pushed them aside, making an access road. Soldiers followed the dozer, lugging their hand tools and cleared the debris. Anthony Mouton, age 20, grew up listening to Louisiana plantation workers sing as they plowed fields. Now, he heard soldiers sing as they built the road. Bivouacs moved every three to four days. Trucks carried their sleeping and barrack bags. Empty 55-gallon fuel drums fixed with a stovepipe and a spark arrestor provided warmth and tents. Soldiers experienced cold, bone-crunching cold. A mess sergeant cut a hole through the ice for water, and an hour later, he found frozen mud. With heavy equipment arriving, the cat skinners found the swampy, decaying vegetation and dirt called muskeg. Trucks and dozers sank into the muck. Only layer upon layer 
of corduroy solves the problem. And to this day, a 23-ton D8 bulldozer swallowed by muskeg remains, excuse me, remains buried at Devil Swamp. All of the engineers dealt with muskeg and permafrost and bone-crunching coal. The soldiers ate canned or powdered milk, eggs, vegetables that taste like cardboard, Spam, Vienna sausage, chili, lemonade called battery acid, corned beef hash called silage and stew. The number of discarded Spam sandwiches could have paved the road, and mosquitoes covered pancakes in minutes. The cooks called it seasoning. The 70-mile access road reached the Teslin River on June 16th. The 340th in Skagway convoyed to the Scouts and Pontoon Ferry rode up to the river to Morley Bay. Those in Whitehorse arrived at Morley Bay via steamboat. The 340th began building the road in July. Hogue ordered them to blaze a single lane truck trail towards Watson Lake. The black soldiers of the 93rd followed them, upgrading the truck trail to a pioneer road, building culverts, bridges when needed. On September 25th, the white regiment 340th and the 35th met at Contact Creek and the Pioneer Road was connected from Dawson Creek to Whitehorse. The north section of the Alaska Highway belonged to the Black Soldiers of the 97th. They would build the northern end of the highway through Alaska, but the generals, Sturdivant and Hope, didn't expect, expect much than pick and shovel work from the Black Soldiers. So General Sturdivant hired Lytle and Green, civilian contractors, and they would build the road, and the black soldiers would follow with hand tools and a few dozers. On April 29th, the USS David Branch carried Colonel Whipple's 97th Engineer Regiment to Valdez, Alaska, population 530. Two to three feet of snow covered the ground. Mountains blanketed with snow soared high, towering over the town. Valdez, closer to the Arctic Circle, was much colder than Skagway or Dawson Creek. Black soldiers took four days to disembark from the branch, and one of those soldiers was Private Robert Rucker. Private Haywood Olbrey, a college graduate and a sculpture artist from Louisiana, looked out at the massive mountains with this commentary, quote, when you first behold the beauty and nature in Alaska, you are overwhelmed. It was April, and the snow was on the ground. I had my parka on. And I said, praise God, I've never seen a landscape so beautiful. Staff Sergeant Clifton Monk of Newton Grove, North Carolina, after scanning the same snow-covered mountains and the enormous piles of snow lining the streets, had this to say, quote, it looks like hell on earth. To remove themselves from the local civilians, they marched down Alaska Avenue in Valdez and out onto Richardson Highway, to two camps, Mile 13 and Workman. The officers in Company B encamped at the airfield. Company B also unloaded the ship and kept unloading the ships until the white Alaska National Guard arrived at the end of June. The regiment did not have trucks, nor did they have heavy equipment. Promised by the Army to provide winter clothing in Seattle before boarding the ship didn't happen. Without equipment and trucks or winter clothing, the black soldiers waited three weeks for the Alaska Road Commission to remove 50 feet of snow from the 33,000-foot Thompson Pass. At the end of three weeks, warmer temperatures melted the snow and thawed the icy ground. Vehicles, instead of slipping on the ice, slogged through and sank in the sucking mud. Mosquitoes appeared. Sergeant Monk said, quote, the mosquitoes like to have eat me up. And Obrey complained, quote, you had mosquitoes that died, bombed you. And Sergeant William Griggs, regimental photographer, commented, there were 1,000 per square yard. The pass opened on May 20th, and trucks and heavy equipment arrived that week. Within six days, the 1st and 2nd Battalion convoyed on trucks out to Richardson Highway over Thompson Pass and on to Tosina and Slana. At five miles per hour, 23-ton bulldozers and graders followed. The 97th could have traveled the existing Richardson Highway from Valdez to Delta Junction, then turned and started building the road back toward the Canadian border to meet the white 18th engineers coming north. 
But to keep black soldiers away from Delta Junction, Lytle and Green contractors will build the first 100 miles south from Delta Junction. The 1st Battalion under Major Mitchum started building roads from Slant following the Abercrombie's horse trail. But the regiment had problems with their leadership. Colonel Whipple earned a nickname of Old Grandma at Camp Landing, Florida. He was too fastidious, nitpicky, and he was unable to delegate or enforce. Major Gordon, commander of the 2nd Battalion, with a few of his officers, took advantage of that. They made frequent trips back to town for state dinners and ignored the work by black soldiers who struggled to live, work, and get the job done under the disorganized and self-serving leadership of the 2nd Battalion. Weppel was not equipped to handle this problem. Captain Walter Parsons, the liaison officer in Seattle, moving equipment forward to Valdez, finally arrived in Valdez, and he wrote to his wife about Gordon's subordinate officers and old grandma's failure to address problems. Corporal James M. Hurd, Elberton, Georgia, a comp of Company F in the 2nd Battalion, was promoted to sergeant on June 16. He took charge of a squad of nine men, including Robert Rucker, who ultimately became central to the history of the 97th. Sergeant Hurd assumed responsibility of how they would live and work in Major Gordon's troublesome bat battalion. They stuck together, avoided the white officers, kept their heads down, mouths shut, tried to get the job done as best they could. Light on green civilian contractors with construction equipment arrived in Valdez in July. They moved out on the Richardson Highway, climbed over the Thompson Pass, and set up a base camp at Gulcana Roadhouse. The black soldiers in July were out in front, and they're fighting the Marine at Metaxa Pass. The white civilian contractors were not in the lead, as Sturdivant had hoped. They fell in behind the 97th, upgrading and widening the road. Sergeant Lee Young, age 22, trained by Caterpillar at Eglin Airfield in Florida, commented, quote, I was proud to train these guys. We did more work in the mountains than any regiment. The cat skinner got to know how to drop that blade to keep from tumbling down the mountain, and the Army didn't tell you how to do it. They just told you, you got to do it. Major Gordon's battalion continued to present Whipple with problems, while Mitchum's battalion worked as a team making roads. Not happy with their progress, General Hogue visited the 97th, and he removed Whipple and replaced him with Lieutenant Colonel Lionel Robinson. At the same time, Captain Parsons took command of Company F, and Sergeant Hurd's squad, and Major Gordon was relegated to desk duty. Robinson wrote a memo to every officer, quote, Our job, we are at war. We've been engaged in road construction since June 7th. Fifty days have elapsed. We have completed 30 miles of road, and it would be suicidal to work in this country during October. And at this rate, we wouldn't finish at that time. It takes too long to make simple corrections. Much of our equipment is idle, placed on deadline when good judgment could have prevented it. <laughs> Poor supervision, two to three officers congregate where they're not needed, loafing, and groups of 50 to 75 black soldiers working without officer supervision. Some officers were found sound asleep in jeeps. We must be on our toes. There will be no idea of failure. Pledge yourselves to a renewed effort. Some officers are devoted to duty, and you know who you are. Colonel Robinson's family owned and operated a construction business in Florida, and based on his civilian experience, he reorganized the regiment like it would a work, work crew. Progress speeded up immediately. They pushed through Mentaxa Pass onto Tanana Valley. Pontoons of supplies were floated down rivers. The black soldiers worked hard, and morale was good. They reached the Tanana River, turned south, and began building the Alaska Highway toward the border and the oncoming white soldiers of the 18th. The race between the 97th and the 18th to get to the border first was on. At the end of August, Robinson reorganized again even more radically, and progress speeded up even more. 
Captain Carson, now Company F commander, gave his heavy equipment and its operators to Company B and C. Company B and C, in turn, gave them gave him their men. Carson's company expanded to 500 men. They built culverts, bridges, worked from problem to problem, and companies B and C followed Company A out in front, building roads, grading. Company D operated the sawmill, and Company E built barracks and buildings at headquarters in Tokalaska. Parsons wrote to his wife, well, we moved so fast we could hardly keep up with ourselves. Military protocol went out the window. No drills, no saluting, no roll call. The black soldiers were essentially civilians in uniform. It worked, and it profoundly changed the lives of young black soldiers. It snowed on September 15, and snow covered the ground for six days. Temperatures plummeted. Time was running out. The white 18th continued until Donchek River, where permafrost stopped the regiment in their tracks. Black soldiers reached the border well ahead of the 18th. However, they had to continue making road another 55 miles on frozen ground to White River. On October 25, 1942, the 18th, the 97th met at Beaver Creek, Canada, completing the highway from Whitehorse to Delta, Alaska. The 97th finished their section and believed they could get to go home, and, but the Army left them in Alaska for the winter. A formal ceremony was held on November 20th at Soldier's Summit to celebrate the completion of the Alaska Highway. While this occurred, Colonel Robinson was irate and worried about winter quarters. The 18th had promised them barracks. Both when they got there, there were no barracks. The 97th were still in their tents. Tents were minus 40 degrees. Food would freeze in their mess kits before they could eat it. By November, the men of the 97th turned to face a greater challenge, the winter of 1942-43. One of the coldest on record for northern Canada and Alaska. What was provided? Partially finished uninsulated wood frame barracks and tents. Colonel Robinson had distributed the soldiers along the route from White River to Delta, Alaska, with the impossible duty to keep the road clear. Each company struggled to, pro to provide shelter for their men. Company A built log cabins. Captain Parsons, Company F, including her squad, had buildings laid out, but only two buildings built, and one root cellar was completed. November rolled into December, December 12th. Parsons to headquarters, quote, we have only three days rations. How about sending us something to eat? December 15th, quote, will we be out of uh, rations tomorrow? And December 30th, Parsons lost his patience, quote, send food or send coffins. Men became sick, difficult to get a doctor the length of the road, through the winter camp, ice mushroomed over bridges, seven feet tall. The winter temperature dropped to 72 degrees below zero. The black soldiers did not have enough clothing, and what clothing they had, they shared. After complaints, Bradford Washburn, an expert in cold winter gear, was sent to complete a survey of clothing and equipment of the 97th. His report, sent to Washington, D.C., and to Colonel O'Connor, who had replaced General Hogue, stated, quote, the pathetically ill 97th Engineering Regiment on the northern quarter of the Alcan Highway is doing little else but hibernating at present. The clothing of this unit was in abominable condition. He even sent specimens to Washington, D.C. Barton Mary Hansen remembered the black soldiers near their roadhouse at Big Delta. Quote, an old double cabin served the unit as a kitchen, but the men lived in tents. Their uniforms were so tattered and ragged that we could see their skin. In January 1943, Private K.V. Nelson and Tech 5 Joseph Smith's truck broke through the ice and slid into a ditch. They were 30 miles from camp. They started to walk and 10 miles later built a fire. A few more miles, hands were too frozen to light a match. As they trudged through the snow, cold and fatigue built up for Nelson. At 2 a.m., Smith stumbled into camp. Six hours later, they found Nelson's frozen corpse. February 1943, Special Services brought a report to General O'Connor, commander of the Alaska Highway Project. 
This report stated that the 97th morale was deplorable. So three days later, Colonel Robinson was removed from his command, and Colonel Mitchum, the 1st Battalion commander, was now in charge. General Connor and Colonel Mitchum, the new regimental commander, had gone along with Robinson's unique reorganization, but they didn't agree with it. Mitchum knew that efficiency, morale, and motivation depended first and foremost on military organization and discipline. Army doctrine also held that organization and discipline were especially important for controlling black soldiers. Now with Robinson out of the picture, Mitchum and O'Connor looked to set a virtuous example to scare the black soldiers back to proper military discipline, and they found it on March 10, 1943. Sergeant Hurd and his squad, I get emotional, of nine men. Robert Rucker, Salisbury, North Carolina. Willie Calhoun, Elberton, Georgia. Josh Weber, Savannah, Georgia. James V. Hollingsworth, Jefferson, Georgia. Yeah. Willie Howell, Madison, Georgia. Dean Fox, Pittsburgh, Mississippi. Warren H. Lindsay of Wilson, North Carolina, B. I. Rapa of Norwood, North Carolina, Sims Bridges of Pritchard, Alabama. They were detached to the H&S Company load uh, landed at Big Ursul River. Nineteen days later, the temperature fell to 34 below zero. The young white commanding officer, Lieutenant Howell, ordered the ten black soldiers to climb into the back of an unheated partially covered and with truck with ice accumulated in its bed. Heard tried to reason with Howell, but Howell said the truck would be fine for a routine 130 mile trip to Fairbanks. The experienced soldiers, knowing that such a trip could freeze them to death, didn't refuse, but they hesitated. And Lieutenant Howell, offended at the challenge to his authority, canceled the trip. He arrested them in quarters and charged them with mutiny. They were taken to the headquarters stockade in Whitehorse. The ten accused black soldiers chose their company commander, Captain Parsons, to defend them. And Captain Parsons watched his opponent, the masterful trial judge advocate, glide right past the absurdity that mutiny, a word redolent of violent rebellion, vile cowardice, and even treason, boiled down, in this case, to, quote, refusing to get upon a motor truck. A court-martial in June 1943 convicted nine of them, including Robert Rucker, for mutiny and to serve time and hard labor. Isabel Wilkerson sums it up in her recent book called The Warmth of Other Sons. I don't know whether uh, you all have read that. It's about the immigration of the 1920s of the blacks to the north. But this is a quote from her book. An invisible hand ruled the lives of all colored people in the entire South. It wasn't one thing, it was everything. They had determined that white people were in charge and colored people were under them and had to obey them like a child in those days had to obey a parent. Except there was no love between the two parties as there is between a parent and child. Instead, there was mostly fear and dependence and the hatred of that dependence on both sides. This invisible hand ruled in the military. Thank you. I want to do something. Uh, we did plan. Okay. Uh, there is in the second book. I personally had a favorite character. Chris is our last time. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the last person who might conceivably have known more about it than her passed away about six months ago. So we're looking at it. But this gentleman was my favorite simply because I grew to love him because the stories that I knew about him were so terrific. And he was so typical of the young men who came from these three or four southern states. I'm not going to attempt to tell you all the stories. We'll see why in just a second. But Fad Bryson, who grew up near Old Fort, 
for government. And grew up almost certainly expecting to spend his life there. Suddenly found himself in the Army. He found himself in the 97th Engineer. As a cook. And he wound up, before they ever went to the last he wound up at the uh, Air Force Base. Florida, which is where the 97th was when they were dispatched to Alaska. And Thad, first of all, was really struck by the fact that the Pacific Airmen had come there to practice bombing. That's what it was in those days. A place for Air, Army Air Corps pilots to practice bombing. And Thad looked at these guys and they Taught like white men, and they had been to college. They flew airplanes. Then one day, and that's very cautious, and again, you'll see why in a minute. I don't want to screw this story up. But one day, he was in the mess hall, and a the major who commanded the big government, Benjamin Davis Jr., his father was a general walked through, and a young white officer walked past him. Now, I don't know how many of you, I know one man that's ever been there. But we all know that lieutenants do not walk past majors. Stop saluting. That, that, that's a definite no no. And this young white lieutenant walked past this major, and he didn't salute. And the major stopped him, he chewed him out. Then he got the salute that he had done. And the young son. Thad Bryson, standing by it, observed this whole exchange. And when the when white lieutenant moved on, Thad popped to attention and snapped the snap to the salute and the snap. To the major. And when the major returned it, he winked at him and then walked off. Now, that's just one of that Bryson story. But the reason that I poked in here to tell uh, is because the man who told it to me sitting right there. That's first bad son. The reason I was being so cautious is that as I repeat these stories, I was very careful because we wrote about these in the book. I wrote other stories about that in the book. There were many. Uh, and I got that information from the son. So I'm sitting here now working from memory, thinking, okay, here's the man who correct me if I get any of it wrong. So here's your opportunity. So I don't can. I want to be good people to know you were here. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? What ultimately happened to the soldiers that were? Um, that's, that's fascinating because now wait a minute she has to, just a minute <laughs> in the back of this book uh -huh. there's an appendix and each of these 10 men were researched and their birth day death day and what happened to them let me just double check the question what were you asking about what happened in the rest of their life what happened after this, the war? I mean, more what happened with them at this point in the 40s, during, during the war, what happened? Oh, after okay. they were court-martialed? Yeah. Oh, uh, the they Army lived, had a program yeah. in those days. Uh, the Army was incredibly short of personnel, and they really couldn't afford to take guys who screwed up a little bit and leave them in prison the way they probably would today. Keep in mind that in those days, and the book makes this very clear, court martial was a very different thing. It was uh, an instrument of command. So what happened was, if in the Army's judgment, these guys might conceivably be rehabilitated. They could be returned to active duty. So they sent them originally to the first of what they called rehabilitation mistake about it. Talking razor wire, bars, nards, you know, all the yards. They were serving hard labor. Mm -hmm. But they also were being preserved in 
evaluated by psychologists. A significant number of them uh, who were not really bad guys uh, wound up after sometimes a year or more uh, being released and returned back. The court martial happened in 1943. They went to these rehab centers, centers and by 1944, and I forget the general's name, pardoned them. And they went on, stayed in the Army. Uh, some became truck drivers, some went to uh, other service centers, but they were still in the Army. They were all, they lost their rank, they were all private. But Robert Rucker did gain his rank back. He was a Tech 5, and he was the big truck driver before he came home. So oh, away from the highway. Yes. Always in different units. Yeah, and they never were together again. Now we had one guy. Yeah. I'm sorry, before I do this. <laughs> Any more questions? questions or yes. Oh, How long did they actually take to do the highway? I mean from forty forty two, whatever? Yes. Eight months. Eight months. 46, Jan, March 9th, 1942, they started. And November 20th, 1942, they opened the highway. That was 1,600 miles. Correct. And you got to remember, this is not macadam. This is the gravel. This is a truck trail that's been graded and finished. It was dirt. I saw a lot of photos from some of the early ones. And they about what it looked like. Don't, don't build a super highway 1,600 miles in eight months. But keep in mind, they were building through the subarctic north, building through the Canadian Rockies, over the continental divide in three different places. Um, the fact that they did it in eight months, as far as we're concerned, I don't know what I'm fully, I don't remember. But somebody that we talked to somewhere who knew a lot about the history of referred to it as comparable to the Panama Canal. I think it seriously was. There were seven regiments, four white, three black. The regiment was 1,200 men. And then you had the Public Road Administration. In the northern section, most of the public road uh, officials were organized by Lytle and Green of uh, Iowa. But then all along the rest of the road, there were contractors, Canadian contractors, U.S. contractors all working together. There was uh, sur surveyors, not only the military surveyors, but civilian surveyors working together with the military <coughs> to get this done. So you're talking about maybe 10,000, 11,000 soldiers, plus maybe another five to 7,000 civilians that helped build this highway. But it's important though, because eight, uh, eight months, understand that these civilians were there. Yes. The road was completed and, uh, and a lot of the military units were pulled out. That, that it was the following year yes. when the civilians, most of whom went home to stay warm in Ireland. And then came back. back. And then over the next two or three years, they improved the road into something much better. They the Alaska Highway, as, as it became known from driving from not only uh, Dawson Creek all the way up to Fairbanks, was open in 1946. So they had that huge bridge. All the bridges were done by TRA, made out of steel, but the Army made them out of wood. So the trees. The road that Fred's dad helped him, yeah. 1,600 miles, it was built by the military, very little to It's just, even today, today, there are stretches where you drive your water home over and you will regret it. Even then, you look at this, and it's just unbelievable. It's a two lane road, just two lanes. Two lanes. Anybody else at Zoom? Yes, sir. Did the military ever use it? You know, that's the interesting part. Okay, now you're getting into history. <laughs> but here's, what really, here's what happened in the end. They, in the middle of all this, 
Again, there's so much you can't cover in a program that is long. But a lot of people don't realize that the Japanese did attack. Japanese held American soil. It was not the only place where the Japanese held American soil. There were two islands at the end of the Aleutian chain. And that occurred right in the middle of this project. So if anybody had any doubt that we really needed this road, the Japanese pretty well took and, care of that. And one other thing. You know, it was a coincidence. You forgot Dutch Harbor. They you bombed Dutch Harbor. They bombed Dutch Harbor as well as occupying those islands. So the Japanese did attack and they did occupy America and so on. And it was a very big deal. But here's the coincidence, and this is the irony that makes me for one love history. That attack was part of a setup that the Japanese were doing. And their main effort was a setup at Midway. Some of you have recently seen the movie about Midway. What happened was uh, the Americans, for the first time, the Japanese were doing whatever they pleased, anywhere they were. At Midway, that changed forever. The Japanese went on the defensive and stayed there. And that happened to be at exactly the same time they were attacking the Aleutians. They landed at Atu and Kiska. <clears throat> and Charter. Yeah, and they bombed up Charter. So, I'm sorry I'm taking so long, but to get back to your question, here's what to me was ironic and really kind of true, ironic. The Remember, we mentioned, Chris, that earlier in the thing, we showed a picture of the Canadian airfield. Okay. We had this chain of airfields in Northwest Asia. And the whole time that the American Army was working on the Alaska Highway, they had chosen over the objection of an awful lot of people to follow the route of the Northwest Asia. Airfield to airfield. So as the highway came into being, got finished, it became fairly obvious once in 1943 the army, the American military, uh, drove the Japanese out of the Aleutians, that no, they were not going to use the island to haul great quantities of stuff up there, and they thought they were going to have to. But the funny thing happened, because Len Lee's uh, had been expanded to take, especially airplanes, warplanes, the Soviet Union, which was in dire trouble at the time. Those airfields became the primary route for getting airplanes from American factories up through Canada to turn them over, to get it to Alaska and turn them over to Russian pilots who would fly them across and then across Siberia. And they were very much part of the war on the Eastern Front in Europe. So, in the end, that airfield route that sort of started everything, in the end, became the most important thing about the highway. Because what the highway did was it allowed, it allowed the Allies to maintain and improve, constantly improve, that staging route. Bigger, bigger planes, bigger airports, and so on and so on. I've been accused of answering the talk forever. This is not quite forever. Yeah. It's not paid today. No? No. Um, Roosevelt, it's Roosevelt wrote the check. <laughs> yes. Which by today's standards was bad, but it was enough in those days. And of course, they had to make an agreement with Canada. Remember, we were invading a foreign country. Normally, you don't send thousands of soldiers across the border into Canada. But Canada was pretty desperate, too. And uh, the Prime Minister, Kennedy King, agreed to this. Mm -hmm. Part of the agreement was that when it was all over, the United States would turn the entire highway to Canada. Canada. And was it 1946? 48. Mm -hmm. Turned it over to Canada. So 
called Canada maintains it. But it's not paying. They have a system there, and they have some kind of fabric that they put down and uh, gravel and another layer of fabric and gravel because you still have hundreds of feet of permafrost that thaws. And so the last hundred miles of the road, I called my rumba ripple because you went over it this way, but you also were moving this way. And we stopped many times as they were constructing and rebuilding this road, watching this fabric or replacing culverts, great big metal. Yeah, the old wooden culverts. They were ta I was taken out. And I stopped at this one girl was driving this dozer. And it just fascinated me that she was driving a dozer, you know, but I couldn't do that. So I asked her, I said, oh, how long have you been working on this highway? She says, uh, since 1942. <laughs> so they continually have to rebuild, replace, and there's certain bad places on the highway that have a lot of that permafrost. You remember driving. This is why the big rigs has so much trouble. Yeah. But if you picture this. She's um, got. Is, yeah. is the first the reason why they haven't taken it? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, no, it's it's misunderstanding that. It's bad. No, it is gravel. You said gravel, gravel. And then, then they roll and things like that. But if you put oh, cement but, down right. or macadam, is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah, no. Then you have this. Right. And they do. Yes, but not to that great extent. Well, it just well, is well, not well, sustainable. It's a misunderstanding there. When you drive what Chris calls around the rim, you're driving on the yeah. But what you have to understand is that you're also driving on water. Yes. In other words, uh, it comes in a couple a lot of varieties. Of the, the, the bus keg is, is mud that is thick with water that is awful. But the, but the permafrost was just on it. When they ran into that, they basically didn't let them do it. Because permafrost may be water. And frozen You're right. hundreds of feet down. Yeah. It has some debris across the top of it and maybe a few scrum of trees and whatnot. And soldiers made a mistake by removing it. very instant you remove that debris and insulation <laughs> at the top, three or four feet will melt. Right. And you just keep doing it. So it's funny today, I mean, first of all, it's that Roman ripple effect where it is paying. In fact, on our first trip, uh, they had just finished it. We've all seen a brand new road with white strips along the side. They're all brand new. Yeah, they did. And but but uh, an RUV and it be like this: brand new road, <laughs> and you're twisting both directions at once. I've never I've never seen a road do that. Going 20 miles an hour. What we all about? Truck camper. Do not take oh, your Class A motorcycle. <laughs> do <laughs> not. <laughs> People aren't down here don't know about trucking very much because they're, they're not used to it. Yeah. But the advantage of a truck camper is that it sits in the back of your truck. So you ride on a heavy duty truck suspension through that. You gotta go slow and careful, but it doesn't do damage. But if you take one of these big, uh, big motor homes, do this there. The, the front wheel is in one dip in this direction, the rear wheel is in another dip in this direction. You know what I mean? They twist around each other. So, yeah. Goodness, I have one question that I often, not often, but on occasion I'm here dead, speak of the heavy equipment that was lost in this permanent frost. Not to be covered. Has the Army, to any ex at any extent in the past, sought to recover that equipment? As a matter of fact, uh, at the end of this, we've got some stuff on the table back there. There's a pile of cards, business cards, and one of them I hope you all pick up and look because I posted about this two weeks ago. Uh, no. There are, there's controversy about how many. We know for absolute certain that the 93rd engineers left a DA bulldozer. I don't know how deep 
Big, big devils? When, when it disappeared, they, they tried latching onto it, pulling it out with the bulldozers, and it just kept sinking. And at the end of it, they, they had men with long poles poking, <laughs> trying to find it, and they couldn't reach it. And as far as anybody knows, it's still there. It's not the only one. The road is also lined. I mean, they didn't have time to clean up. It was called the Hook Camp Highway for a reason. Kilogram. Oh. There was also abandoned trucks, uh, abandoned dozers. Um, and there is a wonderful man who, Fort St. John, Prince Columbia. Um, he died out. this year. He died this year. Marl Morales. Uh, Marl Brown. Marl Brown. Long white beard, just as long as your white beard. Long white hair. I'm tempted to go back to you start finding this stuff. <laughs> An amazing little man. An amazing little man. But he, what he had done is he was fascinated by the amount of bad equipment. And he collected it. And he collected it. And he brought it back to Fort St. John. And he spent years raising money uh, to put together a museum that for people who drive to Alaska Highway. There are other places. Um, off topic, but there was a thing called the Cahola, which was after the highway. They abandoned it and then struck it. And, and there's a lot of equipment still out there. All the way up. Oh, that's right. lined with abandoned bulldozers, trucks, <laughs> rusty. One turn off from the highway right where you had to hold up. Six or eight vehicles that to this day are still sitting there. Did you, did you observe me that you were yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I have to walk through all this, and I swear I don't want to use some pictures. It's, uh, but I posted things because I find this fascinating. So if you're interested, uh, the post is pretty simple. I just put up the post. There's all kinds of topics, but you could run a search or just scroll through it, and you're going to find several. You find that one's a picture of Marl Brown and her, which is, which is one of my favorite from all of our trips up there. Marl's a skinny old man. I would say at that time, he was in and everybody knows him. Get to Fort St. John. First Fort Nelson. To, He's a Fort, Fort Nelson. People point you to his museum, and it's all him. And he has this weird bicycle. Bicycle. The front moves this way, and the rear moves in the same direction. So in order to get on it, he had to go ahead and try riding on that bicycle. I said, "You're nuts." <laughs> I have a picture of this man beard, riding this on that long bicycle. Long white beard. And he's on that unicycle crazy. I've never seen him like it. Apparently, built himself. And he's riding around in circles doing his thing. And she's standing there watching him with her eyes. Sure, you don't want to try it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 